Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Corn Baptist Church. A very warm welcome. Have you been here lots of times before? Or have you been here just a few times before? I don't think there's, looking at faces around, I don't think there's anyone who's not been here ever before. Um, but everyone's very welcome and welcome if you're joining the uh, stream on YouTube as well. Um, just as I came up to the front, I noticed that this um, microphone is very loose and there doesn't seem to be any way to tighten up that that's very obvious. So it might suddenly flop, but mostly maybe I'll be on the uh, lapel mic, but apologies if that happens at an inopportune time. Um, I do tend to fidget with the uh, lectern as well, which doesn't necessarily help. Um, just, uh, I was going to mention one notice as we begin. Um, part of it was going to be to say, parents, please supervise your children carefully. Um, I'm not sure whether roof counts um, under that. Um, you may have noticed that we've got scaffolding up around the hall um, and it's in progress, the work. And there's also some of the old battens over on the garden over there. So even adults, perhaps you, you, know, you might be, um, what's the word? In, well, no, I wasn't thinking that. You, you might just be inquisitive. That's the word I was looking for. You might be inquisitive, but just be careful if you're inquisitive. There is actually, we weren't expecting anyone to be working today, but I mean, the weather's not been very good for roof work, as you may have noticed. So someone has come this morning to do a bit of lead work. Um, it, we shouldn't hear them from over here. Um, he said if it's too noisy to tell him. Um, so uh, that's just an expression if you do hear something going on. Um, other than that, notices are in the notice sheet as usual. Please do make a note of those. Um, this week, uh, you, you may have noticed uh, a little, I'm not sure what to call it. I've just cut and paste some comments about floods around the Manali area. We support DUF, the uh, home and school in Manali or just outside of Manali. And we've also in the past, Mandy did a sponsored walk for the hospital, Christian Hospital in Manali. And there's bad floods around there. So I've just cut and paste some information. And on the prayer diary tomorrow, I'm asking you to pray. You can pray today as well, if you like. But I am asking you in the prayer diary to pray tomorrow. So that's just to explain where that comes from. Of course, Ju Ju Jan has been visiting recently, and she's added some personal comments from her experience as well. OK, I'd like our worship at the start just to focus on the Lord and to, to put our trust in him as we worship him. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Can we say that this morning? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's stand together and sing. Die. 
Christ alone, cornerstone. We give you praise and thanks, Lord Jesus, this morning, because you alone are the Saviour. You are the cornerstone, the sure and steadfast foundation of our salvation and a foundation for our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you're an anchor that holds us fast in a high and stormy gale. Thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus Christ. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, as we gather together this morning, as we come meeting together to meet with you, we pray you'd help each one of us to place our trust wholly in your name, to lean on Jesus this morning. And Lord, if we're going through stormy times, may our eyes be upon you. If we've been through stormy times. Lord, may that experience of you guiding us through and bringing us through, may that give us strength to encourage others also. And Lord, may our eyes be on Jesus this morning in all that is said and done while we're together. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's continue to worship our Lord Jesus, 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 holy and anointed one.
it fell down during the prayer but I caught it so it didn't make a loud crash um, Jean right do you know I thought for a moment that there wouldn't be the need for an all age talk but it's an all age talk so even if children hadn't come you would have got me i'm not going to apologize i'm going to talk about being on the front line what a surprise and then i thought i was there are two really special people in the bible which i love very much and um, they're not kind of well-known people, but they are called Bezalel and Aholiab. Now, I love these two people because they're very crafty people. They do lots of things with their hands, and they are good at it. And I'm going to tell you why they're good at it. So from Exodus chapter 31, then the Lord said to Moses, see, I have chosen Bezalel son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge, and all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. What a star! Don't you think? What an amazing man. And God had chosen him to work on the tabernacle. And I thought, what if he said to God, no thanks. I don't think I want to work on there because I'm quite happy making beautiful things in my house for my, me and my family to enjoy. And do you know, people might be critical if I do something outside there. They might be going and looking and saying, this isn't quite good enough for the tabernacle, for the place where we're going to worship God. Now, so what is Bezalel going to do? Well, I'll tell you, he did go and work for God. He did move on to the front line and do the task that God has given him. Now, the good thing, good news, was that he wasn't working on his own. Moreover, I have appointed Aholiab, son of Ahizamak, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Wow, isn't it good when we can work with other people to reach out with the gospel? I like that. And then... It gets even better. Also, I have given skill to all the craftsmen to make everything I have commanded you. And then there's a whole long list of all the things that they needed in the tabernacle. 
It was a daunting task. It was a big task. But Bethanel wasn't on his own. He had a holy ab to help him, and they had many craftsmen to help them. So I'm going to say to you God is not looking for your ability. He's given you the ability to do things. If you look back over your life and you look at the things you have learned and the things you're good at now, God has built them up. He's looking for your availability. So this morning, I have got invitations, invitations to be on God's front line. And I thought, what kind of things would God ask us to do? Right, my first one. You are invited to be a good friend. Who thinks they can be a good friend? No one. Come on, come on. This is the easiest thing to be a good friend. You know, notice whether your friend needs help. Say hello when you meet them in the street. If you're playing at preschool or school, go and say hello. Go and say hello and say, would you like to play with me today at playtime? I'm so looking forward to playtime. Shall we look at another one? Invitation to be on God's front line. You are invited to pray. Now, I'm not taking any excuses here because everybody can pray. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. It doesn't matter. You can talk to God. And I'll tell you another big secret. God will listen. Isn't that good? So, shall we do another one? Oh, my, my daughter would like this. You are invited to babysit for a young couple so that they can have quality time together to go for a meal or maybe go to the log together. How lovely would that be? Do you know anyone who would like to do that? I've got loads. How long's your sermon? <laughs> you are invited, my husband's favorite one. You are invited to ask someone to join you for tea and cake. Lovely. You are invited to make a gift for someone. You can use your skills and make a gift. This might be a bit more limiting. A fewer people can do this. You are invited to preach one week and give Ian a break. Now, I can see a few, a few men in here who are really good at that. We are really blessed in our conversation with uh, people who can do that. You are invited to speak to a new person and make them feel welcome. Whether that's in here or whether that's at school or whether that's at work, it doesn't matter where it is, on the front line, that's a lovely little welcoming job, isn't it? I like that one. Oh, this is to give me a rest, and Mandy, and Malk. You are invited to give the All Age Talk next Sunday. Now, I think that's a really good idea, and I could go around and drum up Drum up some volunteers for that one, Ian, for you, yeah? You are invited to send a letter or a small gift through the post. Well, you can think about who you're going to send that to. You might send it to our log frogs. You might send it to a friend who was a missionary that you know. You might just send it to a friend that you haven't seen in a while. You are invited to stop and ask someone how they are. Sometimes we forget to ask people how they are. We assume because they're in church, they're okay. Not everyone is. So that would be lovely, wouldn't it? Say, how are you today? You are invited to chat to a neighbor over the fence. Now I've got a lovely neighbor and I don't chat over the fence, I chat through the fence because we've left a gap in so that I don't have to stand on tiptoe and balance and talk over the fence to Phoebe. But uh, she likes the gap in the fence. We said we would fill it and she said no. 
no, don't do that. And my last one is not the last one. You, there are loads that you could, you could think of. You're invited to join the Open the Book team. Now, I'm going to tell you that I do open the book. So does Mark, so does Heather, so does Rose. We have quite a few people in here who do open the book. And I'm going to tell you, I am totally out of my comfort zone doing open the book. I am not very good at remembering my words, even if I've only got one sentence to say. And sometimes I don't even pick up the, the cues of when I'm meant to be speaking or where I'm meant to be on the stage. But I have a go. But I am out of my comfort zone. So if anyone else wants to come and take my place to open the book, I would be really grateful. That would be really good because it doesn't matter, does it, if you're out of your comfort zone? It's a joy to do it. It's a real joy. And um, why do you do it? I do it because we go and tell Bible stories, act them out to the primary school. So you are sitting in front of, I don't know how many, 150 about, I would say, 120, I don't know, key stage one. You are extremely well behaved. <laughs> yeah, they don't heckle at all, do they, Mark? Not like, not like people in church. No. So that's being on the front line. You maybe have got other front lines that you could be on, that you could, uh, but God invites you to be on the front line working for him. And I can't compete with um, chunky Kit Kats at all oh sorry about that <laughs> i don't even go over there now over there i was thinking about this and saying what is the point of being on the front line and it's to share the love that god has put in us with other people it's to share the good news of jesus the good news is sweet isn't it so we have sweets now they are there god has chosen you to give those out. But unless you come and take them and put them in the dish and hand them out, it won't happen. So what I want is, now I'm, I was going to say, all the children come and get a dish, put the sweets in there, and I want everybody in church to get one sweet at least. Now, I could do it on my own. I could run around like a lunatic handing out sweets. But if you all help me, can I walk over there and pick up a dish, David? Is it possible without? Ah, oh, excellent. I was thinking I might put these under the chair and say, if you find one of these under the chair, please come and get some sweets. So. I'm sorry, but you're right at the front there. Who, who would like to be a part of this? Oh, yes. Right, you go and put some sweets. And you want to make, do you want to have a go? Yeah. You want, I want to make sure that everybody in church gets a sweet. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to give them out. Excellent. What a team. What a team. Oh. Now, I haven't got any more dishes, but if you want to come and take a handful and hand them out, you can. How are you going to make sure that everybody gets one? Thank you. Green is my favorite. Now, my husband is saying, is anyone going to climb the stairs? <laughs> I'm watching Mandy. I'm watching her. <laughs> yeah, you have to give them out. You could give people a double dose, couldn't you? And give them two. They could have a second. 
I have thank you, but I will have another one. <laughs> <laughs> don't eat it yet wait till after the next song <laughs> otherwise elaine and i will be singing on our own <laughs> Now, is there anyone who has not shared in the sweet message of the gospel? God loves you, and he wants you to tell everyone else that he loves them too. And I think that's just such a blessing. So as we go out from here, let's make sure that we are on the, our own front line and we are doing these little things for God because these little things mount up. And I'm very well aware that something that we do might be building on something that someone else has done. And what we do will, that will move that person forward and then someone else will come across them. And it might not be us that leads someone to salvation. It might be someone down the line, but we've done our little bit on our front line and that's important. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the places you put us in. And it doesn't matter whether we're at home, at work, walking in the village, at school, at preschool, at college. It doesn't matter where we are, as long as we listen to you and we're on your front line, you have put us there and you will give us the ability and the skill to share the love of Jesus. Thank you that you fill us with your spirit and he fills us with all power to do the things that you want us to do. We thank you, Lord, so much. And we want to serve you to your glory. And in Jesus' name, Amen. I'll have words later because we're going to shine, aren't we? Let's stand together and sing shine. When we serve God on the front line, we're going to shine his light into the world. So let's stand together and sing. Shine from the inside out that the world will see you live in me. Shine from the inside out that the world will see you live in me. You know me as you love me. You know. It's going to take a long time. The children are all going to go out to their groups now. <laughs> but to their groups is just in the corner over there. And just Heidi this morning.
often the, the function of the next part of the service is to give parents time to come back after they take their children out. But it's also good to sing and to lead into our time of prayer. So I've got a, a hymn for us to sing. And then David is going to come and pray for us. Hopefully he sets the um, microphone volume correct before he comes up. Do you, David, do you want this one back up for you to pray? Or are you going to use one of those? Yeah. Okay. And then after David prays, um, Norma's going to come and read. And probably also if you read uh, one of the singer's mics, it's going to be the easiest. So we're going to sing. And I think it's a good song to lead into a time of prayer because it's quite a prayerful song in itself, a quite prayerful hymn. Thou whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight. This is talking about God who is the almighty creator of all things. He spoke and chaos and darkness were dispelled and the order of creation was created. Hear us, we humbly pray, and where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray, let there be light. We're praying for light to come into the world, really. We're continuing to think about shining, aren't we? So let's sing this and then David will come and lead us in prayer. Let's stand together. Today. wasn't going to risk the lectern. So we're coming to our, our prayer time. I'll just introduce each section as we're, as we're praying together. Let's pray. We have, we have an adorable God, so let's adore him. Lord, we praise you, the living God. We praise you, the God who is alive and the God who gives us life. We praise you for your acts for and on behalf of your people down the centuries and across the world. For the record of all you have said and done in the scriptures. For all we can learn of you through the work of the Holy Spirit upon the pages of the Bible. We praise you for the truth we have received about Jesus Christ and his knowledge and love of the scriptures for the way they guided his life and ministry as your uniquely precious son. We praise you more that he has become the very focal point for every part of our lives, 
and for the fulfillment of Scripture in him. In his life on earth, his death on the cross, and his resurrection from the dead, he gathered up and completed all that down the centuries you had promised. We praise you for the assurance in him that no matter the trials and problems we face today, we, like him, will share in your promise of the ultimate victory of your purposes for all your creation. In the name of him, whose life and presence fulfills your word. Amen. And we confess our sins. Lord, we confess your right to exercise your sovereignty over the whole of your creation and over every part of our lives. But from the very beginning, we have used our free will to please ourselves and not you, to live for our own ends and not for yours, and to spoil our relationship with you and with each other. We also confess that we've fallen short of living lives that bring you glory. There's no way that in our own strength we can put our world or our lives in order again. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, forgive us, cleanse and renew all things for the glory of your name. Amen. And a word of thanksgiving. Lord, we give you thanks for the truth of your word in the Bible, for the stories of men and women who were chosen and called and who served you, for all teachers and preachers and for biblical scholars who have brought the meaning and the joy of the Bible alive for us today. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that the Bible is not simply a record of things that happened long ago, but that you still speak to people today through your word. We're filled with gratitude for the way you've spoken to us through your word at particular moments in our lives. When we were sad, you comforted us. When we were wayward, you warned us. When we wandered off on our own way, you called us back to yourself. When we were lost, you spoke and led us home. When we were afraid, you gave us hope. When we thought we knew best, you waited patiently and loved us still. When we were hurting and there was no one to help us, you came and held us in your arms. Thank you, Lord, for being there when no one else wanted to or could be. Thank you that Jesus is always your word of hope to us. Amen. And some prayers of intercession, and we'll try and pick up some of the points that have been mentioned this morning. Everlasting God, we join together in praying to you for the needs of the church, the world, our communities and ourselves, trusting in your love which reaches out from before the foundation of the world. A prayer for the building of the church. Mighty God, thank you that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Jesus said that he would build the church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Lord, fill your church with the security that comes from knowing we are protected by you. Fill us too with boldness to reach others. You are able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or imagine, according to the power at work within us. To you be glory throughout all generations forever and ever, through Jesus Christ, 
our Lord. Amen. Prayer for church leadership and the Baptist Assembly last month, um, newly accredited ministers and pastors were commissioned. So let's pray for them with this prayer as they begin to live and work in, in this new phase of their calling. All knowing God, thank you that you are our shield and strength. Your word says that you will bless your church abundantly. Please protect our church leaders from attack and fill them with fresh vision as they shepherd your people. Strengthen their spirit and restore their souls through the work of your Holy Spirit. May they find rest in your loving care. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden our hearts and theirs and bring peace to our souls today and for all days. Amen. And a prayer for protection. Loving God, we bring before you the worldwide church, all so different and diverse, yet all seen, known, and loved equally by you. Heavenly Father, protect your church from attacks and persecution. Use your church to provide a haven of safety and refuge for those in need. Please use your church to extend your kingdom in this world and to bless the communities in which we're placed. Use your church to refresh and revive the weary and hurting. Use your church to equip your people for works of love and service. Use your church to proclaim the joyous message of the gospel. Use your church to demonstrate your faithfulness to a watching world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we pray especially for our brothers and sisters facing persecution in Somalia. We pray for your protection against rising extremism and that isolated Somali believers will know your comfort and find ways to grow in their faith. We pray also for your wisdom and protection over the open doors work in the Horn of Africa, that it will bear much fruit. And Father God, we do pray as well for our friends in Manali, uh, working in the school, the home, and the hospital who have been subject to such a tra traumatic time as the floods have washed away so much of the infrastructure and it's difficult to even to get basic necessities. And so we pray for them, give them wisdom in providing for the children and providing for the patients in the hospital, for supply routes. And we pray your hand of protection and love over them. May they know your presence this morning. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Finally, we thank you for the love we share with our families and friends. We recognize that they may have faults and they love us in spite of ours. Help us to be flexible and adaptable in all of our relationships and also capable of accepting constructive criticism. Loving God, we bring before you the children and families who this week have finished school for the summer break. We know that the summer can be a joyous time of togetherness and memory making. However, we're also aware that it can feel like it goes on forever, where there are difficulties such as relationships, juggling care, finding extra meals and isolation. So a time of peace turns into a time of anxiety and stress. We ask for you to be with all over this time. Grant rest, peace and harmony and help us as your church to reach out and shine your light into this community. We bring all these prayers in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Amen. Today's reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 20, and that's on page 1153 of the Pew Bibles. Page 1153, Corinthians 1, chapter 12, 1 to 20. It's about concerning spiritual gifts. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters. I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Unity and diversity in the body. Just as a body through one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so as Jean mentioned, Earlier on, we're continuing our Frontlines series this morning, um, thinking about uh, how we're on the front line for God, serving God. And it's a bit like a battle. The Christian life is like a spiritual battle, fighting everything that is against God. In many ways, the gospel itself is our front line. We're looking to defeat those ideas that set themselves up against Christian truth. Ideas like pluralism, the idea that there can be lots of different truths somehow, even if they contradict each other. The idea of scientific materialism, that there's nothing in the world except material things. And some people base their life upon that. They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in life after death because they think science must be able to explain everything. And the ideas of hedonism, living life to the full, because that's all that there is. So you live life to the full. You try and find pleasure as much as possible through experiences in life. These are the kind of ideas that set themselves up against the gospel, against God. And our 
part of our front line is to fight against those ideas in different ways. We thought about that in a general sense of the church's front line. But we also thought last week about our personal front lines, because it's not just a together thing as we serve God, but it's also something individually for us. When we're gathered together, we're all in one place, and there aren't many who don't trust in God gathering with us. But when we go out, we bump into all sorts of people. And so we have a personal front line wherever we go because we're all meeting different people. And through the example of our lives, through our, the responding words which we say when people ask us about what's going on in our lives, and then sometimes also when we find openings to share something of the gospel, through those things, we are active on those front lines wherever we go to serve God. So our personal front line, part one, is wherever we go. This morning, we have our personal front line, part two, which is whoever we are. Just take a look around church this morning. Look around at this motley crew of people that are gathered here. Uh, no, this, this lovely crowd of people that are gathered here this morning. Do you notice something? We're all different. We're all different. We're all individuals. Of course, as we look around, we just see that people are different. But if we were talking to each other and that, we find that there's different personalities and all sorts of differences in our lives. We heard in the Bible reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, two different pictures of differences working together for a common purpose. As Paul writes to the church in Corinth, which had a few problems, it wasn't a perfect church, and that's why Paul was writing to them. They had a few squabbles. And Paul is writing to say, look, there's different things that different people do, but they all work together for the common purpose. And there might be different people with different personalities and different backgrounds, but they all work together for the common good. I'm putting Paul's pictures the opposite way round. So the body first as a picture of the church. The church is the body of Christ. And a body has different functions. Some who've studied biology or medicine might be able to name a lot more different functions of the body than others. But we know there's a digestive system and there's the heart and the lungs, there's blood vessels, there's muscles, there's bones, there's skin. They've all got different jobs to do in the body. And actually, when just one of them isn't doing its job, it can be a problem for the rest of the body as well. Paul says that even the parts that seem small and seem unimportant, actually they're still important. They're part of the overall functioning of the body. He says, don't be jealous if you feel you're just a small part of the body. If you feel insignificant in the body, don't feel down on yourself because of that. Because actually, even those parts are important. And vice versa as well. I think maybe we would need to read on from verse 21 and following a bit for this bit. But if you think, well, oh, I'm a really important part of the body, maybe, you know, the mouth. And people can hear me because of the, I'm the mouth. Don't feel boastful about that and proud. If you think that you're the heart and you're pumping blood around the whole body and keeping it going. Don't feel proud. Remember that the small parts are important too. So Paul uses the picture of the body. Every part important and necessary for the overall functioning of the body. In the first part of that reading, he deals with another kind of differences. He's talking about spiritual gifts. 
right, in verse one, now about spiritual gifts, um, it doesn't have the word gifts in it, it's more like now about spiritual things. And then in verse four, there are different kinds of gifts that emphasizes the grace by which the gifts are given. But when we take the, the things together, they're spiritual gifts from God. Verse seven says, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. And then in verse 11, all these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. So Paul talks about different spiritual gifts, but says that they're all for the common good. They're not to promote the one who receives them. They're not just to bless them, but they're to bless the work of the church, the body of the church, the work of the church. In this passage, Paul talks particularly about supernatural gifts. And we heard what they were, messages of wisdom, message of knowledge, gifts of healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues, things which seem to be supernatural in character. We don't perhaps see these day to day in the life of the church. Some churches um, seem to be more open than to others. We're not a church that says they can't happen in the church of the 20, 21st century now, aren't we? 20, always confuse me that you, you, you're the 20s, but you're the 21st century. We don't say that they've ceased. They do seem through church history, sometimes to come in abundance in the church life and sometimes to be less in evidence in church life. Maybe that's partly um, God's plan. Maybe that's partly the church um, becoming too reliant on its own strength and not asking God for the spiritual gifts. So I do believe that these are still possible and we should actually be open to them and pray for them in the life of the church. But as well as these supernatural gifts, there are other kinds of gifts in the church. And I think the, the, the characters that Jean um, talked about this morning are very important in dealing with that. And if you've got the sermon outline in front of you, you'll notice that I've also referenced Bezalel and Aholiab, two of our favorite people in the Old Testament. Bezalel, I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, making artistic designs, cutting and setting stones, working in wood. Now, I know Colin is keen on working in wood, and Jean's very keen in, in material and stitching and things like this. Bezalel, he did them both. And he set stones as well. The Spirit of God gave him those gifts and abilities. Chapter 35 mentions another um, thing as well. Um, chapter 35 and verse 34. And he has given both him, Bezalel, and Aholiab, son of Ahasamach of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. So not only were they good at the crafts, they were good at teaching others as well because God had given them the skill. Now, of course, when we look at skills like sewing and knitting and crochet and carpentry and things like that, we think, well, they're very natural skills, aren't they? We don't think, oh, there's a supernatural skill. But God is giving those skills and even filling with the spirit to empower those skills as well. We are all different. We may have been given different skills and abilities by the Lord. Let's look at another list of um, gifts in Romans chapter 12 and verses 6 to 8. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. 
If it's contributing to needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. You start out the gift and it talks about um, if it's prophesying, you think here's a, a, a list of supernatural skills. But actually the others sound quite possibly natural as well, don't they? Serving and teaching and encouraging, giving to others, leading. So God gives natural abilities and God gives supernatural abilities sometimes also. He gives them for his work in the world. I like the, um, is it an acronym where, that Rick Warren uses in his book, Purpose Driven Life, shape. What's your shape? I'm not talking about biology at this point, but it's an acronym, shape, spiritual gifts, our heart, our abilities, personality and experiences. We're all different in that kind of shape. And that may give us clues as to where our front lines are, because God has made us for particular things. We thought about spiritual gifts a little bit, and maybe we should be open and ask the Lord if it's in his will to give us spiritual gifts to share in the work of the church. What's your heart? Or maybe your passions or your desire or your concerns. What's your heart? If there's a need in church or a need in the world that particularly touches your heart and you're passionate about, maybe that's actually God putting something on your heart for you to do something about as well. Maybe not just to moan about no one doing anything, but he may put it on your heart for you to do. He's shaping you for the task by putting a passion or concern in your heart. We've already thought a bit about our abilities, haven't we? Bezalel and Aholiab. I mean, hopefully, the whole church should remember those names. I know I've mentioned them a few times in my time here. Bezalel and Aholiab. When I was about um, 11 years old, I had a French teacher called Valerie Padwick. When I was about 14 years old, I had a, a French teacher called... Um, Mr. Padwick, I can't remember his first name now, Mr. Padwick, um, they, after I left the school, I, they left the school, I didn't know about that, they let, retired from teaching French, and they became Baptist, well, he became a Baptist minister. Um, many, many years later, well, just a few years later, um, I'm not that old, in my church in Hucknall, who turns up but Valerie Padwick? My old French teacher. In the, in the old days, I wasn't spiritually aware enough to realise that they were devoted Christians. But uh, obviously when they turn up later, Valerie, now a widow, and she had Parkinson's, she was in a care home, but she came when she could. Uh, when she was struggling, when she was really pretty much stuck in her bed, she said, what can I pray about? Give me some information so that I can pray, because I can. I can't get up and do anything, but I can pray. So when we think about our abilities, it may be all too easy to say, well, you know, I'm feeling a bit frail. I've not got many abilities. And maybe in later life, prayer will be more and more important because you're still able to do it. It may be like um, those two fellows in the Old Testament. Do you remember their names? Maybe like them, we've got skills that we can use. Or we could update that list a little bit. Maybe you've got skills in using Microsoft Publisher or skills in the operation of sound desks and microphones. Or maybe skills um, that's not in that list, and it's not particularly a, a modern technology skills in catering and cooking and things. All sorts of different skills that can be involved. You don't think of them immediately as, well, how's that sharing the gospel then? But actually, when they all get put together into the pot of the church working together, they can be valuable for 
God's work. And our different abilities give us slightly different front lines in the work of God. Our personality is part of it as well. Some people are quiet and shy like me. Other people are loud and noisy. I don't know if you know any of those in the church family. But some people are. Some people are very confident and some people actually appear very confident, but they're not, which is another interesting thing in personalities, isn't it? Um, but we have different personalities. Some are very full of empathy and compassion, and others are more sort of processing logical things. But maybe also something of that personality will shape you for your personal front line in God's work. And the last part of the shape is experiences, E for experiences. I think it's Paul's letter to the Thessalonians where he talks about um, God comforting those who grieve so that they can comfort others. So God may give you experiences and you experience God through those things and you're able to then use those experiences. That becomes part of your front line because you've got those experiences. And someone else that's not been through that experience hasn't got it. And so you can actually serve in a way different to them. And, you know, grieving and God's comfort is one example of that. But there may be many other things. And different experiences may lead to a particular kind of serving and work for God because you have that experience. I can't go through this morning all you individuals and try and think about what your front line will be. It would take too long. That's your job to do, to take it away and to pray it through. Lord, am I on my front line? But there may be exceptions sometimes to all I've been saying. I think 2 Timothy 4 verse 5 possibly points to a little bit of an exception. 2 Timothy 4 verse 5, as uh, the Apostle Paul writes, to Timothy, to encourage him in his ministry. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. It seems as though Timothy was a pastor teacher, a church leader, but not necessarily an evangelist. And yet Paul says to him, do the work of an evangelist. Maybe where Timothy was, evangelism was a gap that needed to be filled. And maybe sometimes we can see gaps around in the work of God that maybe we're not quite the right shape to fill that gap. That we might be a better shape than others. We might be better to have a misshape in that gap than no shape at all in that gap. So I do think sometimes. There are exceptions. We can't all say, oh, no, sorry, I'm not the right shape for that work. And everyone's saying that and nobody's doing it. But in general, thinking about our gifts and abilities that God has given us, our heart and our personality will guide us to those works that God is calling us to. But we need to be always aware, can we help in other situations? So your homework is to consider how God has made you. And from that, what your personal front line may be. And maybe to think, how does that fit in with the overall front line of the gospel, the gospel work? And you think, is there a talent or a gift that you're hiding? Something that you're good at? but you're not using to serve God. Timothy was encouraged to fan into flame the gift he received from God. Sometimes we need to develop our gifts so that they're effective for God. Maybe there's a passion or a desire for an area of Christian service and you don't feel you have the ability for it. Pray for equipping and strength. Or maybe where we do feel skilled, 
we need to remember to still pray for the Spirit's help, not rely on human strength, not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Let's serve the Lord on our front lines. Amen. We're going to sing uh, to lead us into sharing communion together. A song which uh, is quite a new one in the church, but uh, we've sung it a few times. It talks about the chasm that was between us and God. But Jesus has bridged that chasm for us and brought us to God's side. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb.
do sit down. We read about the hope that we have in uh, Romans chapter 3, the work that Jesus has done for us. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Through Jesus, we have justification, redemption, atonement with God. And we celebrate that as we remember Jesus' body broken and his blood shed. Let's bow our heads in prayer a moment. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came. For us. You didn't come just to teach us. You didn't come just to show God's power through the miracles. But you came as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And we thank you, Lord, for all that the bread and the cups mean to us. That God himself became a human being presented in the bread. And you went to the cross and shed your blood, fulfilling all of those Old Testament sacrifices. But yours, Lord Jesus, was the perfect sacrifice, not needing to be repeated, but paying for all of our sins. We ask, Lord God, that as we eat and drink, that we would remember these things with thanksgiving in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. And then the words of Jesus at the Last Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So let's remember Jesus as we eat and drink. And those who are serving like to come forward, please. All who are trusting in Jesus as Lord and Saviour are welcome to share in this remembrance of his death. As the bread is served, please, if you want to remember Jesus, just take a piece and eat it as a sign of your personal faith in him. The body of Christ, broken for us.
The cups, let's hold on to them and we'll drink together when everyone is served.
blood of Christ shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Before the communion, we viewed God's mercy with a few words from Romans chapter 3. In the symbols, we've viewed God's mercy again in a physical way. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, or this is your reasonable act of service. Just a moment of quiet. If you've viewed God mercy, God's mercy, if you've seen and applied it in your life, then offer your body as a living sacrifice to serve him. Maybe it's the first time you'd offer your body, your life. Maybe you've done so many times before. Just a moment of quiet. Lord, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices to you. May we be holy and may we be pleasing to you. Grant us strength by your Holy Spirit to use all that we have and all that we are in serving you and making the light of the gospel known. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We'll actually close the service on that thought as well. Amen. Refreshments are served through in the hall as usual this morning. Please do stay, please share in fellowship with each other, and uh, God bless.